Hello, you scamps, you. So, Russell Brand, his new statesman piece, and, of course, the interview on Newsnight, eh? Calling for a revolution and all that jazz. There's been a myriad of responses to the pre-epic buffoon's rant, and it's as much to those responses as to the meat and potatoes of what Brand himself actually said that I would like to address these comments. But let's do the meat and potatoes first. Mr. Brand calls for a revolution against a political elite who appear to be pursuing their own agenda with no regard for the needs and aspirations of the population at large. This is despite the fact that this elite only enjoy legitimacy in their positions through a system which has been designed to ensure that the views of a majority of the population at least inform how that society is organised. Brand contends that since the agenda pursued by the governing elite bears no relationship to the needs and aspirations of the people voting, it would be as well to not vote at all, for the elite now dominate the three main parties we have in the UK, each of which has demonstrated themselves to be substantially complicit in some agenda, other than the concerns and aspirations of the voters they are supposed to represent. The precise nature of this other agenda is merely sketched by Brandwood if we say, just for now, that our politicians dance to the tune of the corporations. I think we can see this is indeed the case. I don't intend to leave that assertion bare and unqualified. I will tease it out as we go along. I think our loquacious, long-haired loon is, essentially, bang on the money. Well, not about the not voting bit, at least not yet, and I will be suggesting a voting strategy later that I believe could prove fruitful, which would itself be pretty revolutionary, but I get ahead of myself. He's right to say our political class is engaged in its own little pursuits, occasionally throwing us the odd bone so we vote for them and not the other guy, but they only throw those bones in very particular directions, because, sadly, only some of us matter. With the current system, we only matter if we A. Vote. B. Vote, but are not set in our ways as to how we vote, and so open to voting for different people at different times, rather than just supporting our team. C. Vote, but must live in one of the areas not so saturated with inflexible voters that the vote, in concert with others, may affect the result. For I may be mistaken, but it seems to me that many people vote as though they were supporting their football team. My party. Right or wrong. Come on, you blows! Come on, you reds! People are apt to make the mistake of believing the problem is that our system disenfranchises us through the limited impact of our vote. That's but the half of it. The real problem is that however we, the voters, are sidelined, there is still a competition between those who wish to be in government. It's just that we, the citizens, are no longer the awarding judges. We're relegated to the audience. The judges have become other seats of power, corporations who may invest in this country, open shops, or better still, factories. And if they do so, a politician may claim the credit for there being some more jobs. Politicians bend over backwards to be able to present such triumphs as their contribution to our greater good. But here's the thing. Corporations must base their operations somewhere. Logistics, where they're an even playing ground, would often favour manufacture close to market. Will they make that stuff here in the UK? Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. But because our politicians need something, anything to distinguish themselves from each other and so acquire the vote of the pitiful few of us whose vote yet matters... They must be able to present such normal, everyday events as the opening of a factory as their achievement against all odds. It needs to be something they can spin as the, the fruits of their labour and sagacity, something for which we ought to feel beholden to their good judgement. Because then, we'll give them the job they want, and to achieve this triumph, they first collude in the establishing of an economic orthodoxy as defined by the corporations, and then bribe the corporations by letting them off their tax obligations. And because other politicians in other countries are forced to play the same game, we're caught in a vicious circle of a race to the bottom as that beast of legend, the market, dictates the tune to which politicians of all nations dance. The net result. Corporations don't pay tax, and yet they decide and approve the limited pool from which we are permitted to choose our so-called leaders. The corporations are, as Simon Cowell, the only gatekeepers to success, the politicians are the eager contestants, among whom there are always a couple of obedient conformists who, from the very start of the series, are clearly destined to be the finalists. The winner can be any one of those finalists, as they will equally serve Simon's purposes. There are a few others to add a little colour, but they'll never make the final. There's an audience vote to allow some illusion of participation, but everyone knows that whichever of the contestants makes it to the final, they will be perfectly adequate for Simon's purposes. A little latitude is afforded us in that we may choose a boy or a girl this year, but whoever we choose, they will be Simon's creature. That's where we are. Being a politician is not about good or bad or right or wrong. Those discussions are had in front of us, the voters, but don't impact upon the contest in any meaningful way 
because there is no difference between all those politicians' essential practice, which is to guarantee the primacy of corporate interests, excusing them of tax obligations and allowing the exploitation of the populace with such rum gambits as the zero hours contract, a form of contract only possible because the state subsidized the poor buggers on them with supplementary benefits, even though the state is being starved of resources with which to pay such benefits because the corporations who insist on using zero hour contracts aren't paying any corporation tax. So the tax paid by us, everyday Joes, has to be spread thinner to support the people the corporations are refusing to pay a decent wage. This, of course, breeds resentment in certain quarters. A resentment which the mass media, the corporate mass media, of course, deflects from the corporate sector and onto the victims of corporate practice. Politicians of the mainstream now believe that they have no choice but to preserve these primary conditions in order to be admitted to the game. There is only one game in town and only one way into that game. If you challenge the corporate orthodoxy, the organs of corporate dominance, the mass media, will accuse you of madness, irresponsibility, stupidity, or malignancy. So, Brian's right, is he? It's a stitch-up. And engagement with the game inevitably makes you complicit in that stitch-up. Well, possibly not. As we watch those contestants warble their identical Mariah Carey impersonations, we should remember there are other bands out there. You can still find good stuff hidden behind Simon Cowell's processed pap. This analogy is rather getting away with itself. I'm afraid I'm prone to extended analogy, but you, you take my point. Simon Cowell may indeed be the gatekeeper to a short-lived career, commanding the heights briefly as long as you serve his purposes. But there's something better and deeper going on elsewhere. You may say that that may be so, but it's the nature of the game that Cowell is in charge. Perhaps. But here's a thought. If we know the game, perhaps we can play the game better? Perhaps we could even have a bit of a shufty at the rule book and, uh, modify the game? We could, as Mr. Brandt suggests, riot in the streets. But just because that proved a useful strategy in 1789 doesn't make it appropriate to 2013. Look at Poland in 1980. Resistance in the streets, certainly, but barely anything we'd call riots. Or the Velvet Revolution of Czechoslovakia. Jolly japes both, fun had by all, old order kicked out. Of course, they're not exactly the same, the overthrowing of totalitarian communism and our situation, but those societies did have more in common with ours than that of France at the butt end of the ancient regime. We aren't peasantry, ignorant, disparate, unable to organise or communicate. We, by which I mean us lot, the general population, as opposed to those in power, have a fair level and often a high level of education. We can communicate widely, indeed far more widely, than our Eastern European chums could have just 20 or 30 years ago. This humble presentation itself shall serve as adequate demonstration of this. I'm not saying, don't riot, there are other ways. I'm saying, don't riot, because it isn't a way that will work. If we smash modern society structure, I doubt one in a thousand of you could get by snaring rabbits to feed your kids for a few months. And, just to be clear, I'm not saying for one second, don't protest. Protest. But don't give them an excuse to draw battens and charge you down on horseback. Very romantic, dying on the barricades and all that, but it won't get us where we want to be. Dead people don't change things. The people behind dead people change things. And the people behind dead people will yet be the establishment. Hold that thought, because it's important, and I'm going to come back to it. The people behind the dead people will still be the establishment. All this invites a question. Where do we want to be? I suggest we want to be able to influence our politicians to a meaningful degree, which does not mean always getting what you personally want. Political success at this point is not about getting what you want. It's about establishing a political apparatus that is expressive of and responsive to the needs and wishes of the citizens as a whole. It should be able to ensure that business is a perfectly respectable component of what makes a society work and not the object of society, which would appear to be our current situation. Politicians must be the servants of society and not the servants of business. Some may respond. Yeah? Yeah, well, we don't need politicians at all. Do away with a bloody lot of them. That's what I say. Well, the moment you can come up with a model for steering populations of millions without resorting to death caps every time there's a difference of opinion, we'll talk. Until then, grow up. And understand this. Politicians are a pretty corrupt lot right now, but there have been good sorts attempting to steer society a meaningful and steady course. Might there be a couple of them out there now?
What we need are politicians who do not identify theirs and our interests solely with the monolithic interests of big business. Or to put it another way, politicians not utterly invested in the current orthodoxy of what politics in fact is. We need what we used to have, a sort of amateur politician, not in the sense of not being paid, but in the sense of politics being a second career, only pursued after one has built one's real career, be that in the law, the trades unions, or the army, or, or whatever. And the real-world understanding and skills gained in that life, life lived as we live it, is then applied to running the country. And not what we have now. Professionalized clones who studied PPE and then became the assistant to an MP and scrabbled up that greasy pole, impressing people on the way up in the hope of being given a nice safe seat to contest. Such people's end is politics itself, and politics is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. It is a means to enact convictions, convictions wrought in real life, which one hopes will allow and encourage the de healthy development of society. The merely academic understanding of our clones is simply inadequate to the job. So, where do we go? The nationalist parties? No. SNP and Plaid Cymru play to us spectators a little more, but their essential strategies are identical to the three main parties and the economy is king. We need people who don't view the object of governance as an end in itself, to be articulated entirely through the economy. But where should we find such people? I'm guessing a number of you see where this is going. I should say I've never voted for the Greens, have no intention of joining the party. I'm sure most of us have some sympathy with their broad object, but ought we to build an entire society upon an ideological monoculture? Well, no, we really, really shouldn't. After all, that's exactly what we've done ever since the big thatch made monetarism her god, and look where that got us. But politics coalesces around big ideas. There's no point bitching about that. It's a fact. You need to sum up the broad direction of travel and get a lot of broadly like-minded folks on board, and then quibble about the details later. But we can at least choose which big ideas, with all the inevitable, inherent limitations any big idea will ultimately prove to have. So, on the one hand, we have the central idea of sustainability and mankind operating in harmony with its environment, and on the other, mammon, red in tooth and claw society, which only means you and I, our children, and all we love merely servicing the economy like obedient little work units. A green agenda may require sacrifices. A certain amount of yoghurt knitting is pretty much inevitable. It may require people to think differently, to lead simpler lives, to forego some of the absurdities of modern life, and it will certainly be difficult in some respects. But our current situation is hardly free of difficulties. Life will always have difficulties, but perhaps we can choose which difficulties. And anyway, a green agenda doesn't mean we don't care about the economy. A healthy economy is a good thing. It just means we don't care about the economy to the exclusion of all else. After all, all an economy is, is a fiscal ecology. It's a system of processes cycling resources, resources which we depend upon to live. It's an abstraction made necessary by our move from a hunter-gatherer society to our modern specialised society. An economy that doesn't sustain its society is, by definition, a failing economy. At the moment, we impose an ideology on the system. The neoliberal model claims that an economy is autonomous, but the economy, or if you will, the fiscal ecology, is only meaningful if it sustains us. That's the definition of a successful ecology. Does it sustain itself? Driving the dispossessed to riot and chaos is hardly indicative of sustainability, is it? So, use your vote creatively, dare I say it, subversively. Vote, but not for the orthodoxy. Vote green. Now, I said I also wanted to talk about the popular response to Brand from the original New Statesman article onwards, most particularly his detractors. He's enjoyed a lot of popular support, it must be said, but I hope those gagging for a street riot will calm down and try to grasp the point that this is serious, and a few of you dying in the streets would serve the establishment's purposes but not ours. Decide which side you are on, and if you are broadly on the side of Mr. Brand and myself, insofar as you agree that the status quo is intolerable, then try to stay alive because we're going to need you. Popish romantics intent on a glorious death are as much use as they've ever been. That is, sod all. The arguments of Brand's detractors may be split into three main strands. A. By not voting, you abnegate any right to complain. B. Brand is well off and successful, insulated from economic difficulties, and anyway, he's just a comedian, and what does he know about the state of society, the little poser? C. 
Brand may moan, but has he any better ideas? Let's pick these apart. You'll note that as regards the first point, the facially fuzzy Firebrand and I are not in accord, but I do agree that the system as it stands and as it is currently employed by us the voters is almost meaningless. We have swallowed the idea that there are real parties and then there are single-issue parties or nationalist parties that may have in some instances some useful perspective to offer and can serve as a protest vote, but are not really parties of government. Indeed, Parties of government is a clever phrase, dismisses anyone not in accord with the orthodoxy at one convenient stroke. And we must vote for the orthodoxy, or our vote is wasted. So, if we're buggered any which way by playing the game and voting, do we really abnegate our rights in a civil democratic society by not voting? Do we? Surely, if we can have no substantial impact upon the government, we're disenfranchised anyway, so why would a refusal to jump through the hoops as instructed make any difference? We've abnegated nothing, because we had nothing to abnegate. And you all remember what a double negative makes, don't you, children? But this line of argument, which is broadly Mr. Brand's line of argument, depends upon us using the system as we the voters have until now used it. It can be used another way, as I've suggested. Don't vote for the self-styled parties of government, for the orthodoxy. Vote for the green alternative. Vote for people who don't believe the argument begins and ends with the economy. Which is where Mr. Brand and I part company. But I do recognise that a mass refusal to vote could be a statement, could be a valid statement. It just wouldn't advance our position at all. It's valid, but it's not very effective. I suggest being effective. The next objection, that Mr. Brand is a successful, affluent little poser who isn't qualified to discuss our society. Am I being a bit silly, or is it perhaps the case in a democracy that we are all qualified to discuss the nature of our society? That is the case, is it not? I mean, people may opine utter tosh, but then we can counter utter tosh, can't we? We may demonstrate its toshicity, and then hold the toshmonger up to the general derision they richly deserve. So, ought perhaps persons objecting to Mr. Brand's comments either A. Rip into and destroy his argument, or B. Explain the rationale by which comedians or posers or whoever are to be excluded from commenting upon our social condition. Put another way, should they play the ball or should they play the man? We all know an ad hominem attack to be the first refuge of the scoundrel, so what's the object here? Is it, possibly, to encourage dismissal of Brand's argument before it is even considered? Perish the thought! <laughs> I think we can dismiss this objection to the musings of our one-time drug-addled Don Juan out of hand. It's an objection that could only be raised by the sort of person who is in some way complicit in the status quo, whatever pose of exclusion they may be choosing to adopt. Someone like, ooh, I don't know, Robert Webb, perhaps. I've no doubt he means well, and I don't wish to imply any malignancy on his part, but he is terribly middle class. Which is no reason to dismiss his every thought, but the fact is the middle-class left can carry their Labour membership card proudly and never be terribly discommoded by the state of society. Appalled by it, yes, and I don't doubt Mr. Webb is genuinely appalled by it, but not really hurt by it. And the middle-class left are apt to wring their hands and then dish out their own orthodoxies. For instance, they love Orwell. Cry, Orwell, and you've won the argument at a stroke, they believe. But the thing about Orwell, of course, is that he was writing about the 1930s and 40s. He was warning us of the dangers of competing ideologies pushing each other to extremes. Sound warnings. We have something to this day to learn from Orwell, but that doesn't make him a universally applicable magic bullet that ends all discussion. Do you think Orwell intended 1984, with its warnings of a language curtailed in order to disable criticism, to be used as a magic bullet to stop criticism? Ought his warnings of the extremes of ideology be used to support a system that has become the servant of an ideology now run to the extreme, namely neoliberal monetarism, a belief that the market operates as a discrete, inhuman processor of information far superior to any human understanding? Orwell wrote of communism and fascism left loose because they were the demons haunting his days. His lesson is not really about communism or fascism, but about ideology itself and what people will do once they've suborned themselves to an ideology once it's become the unquestioned and unquestionable orthodoxy. So, Mr. Webb, take your own advice. Read Orwell. But pay attention to what he's saying this time. And the last objection. Has Brand any better ideas? Well, as he himself suggests in the course of that Newsnight interview, 
it may be that we ought not look to actor comedians to design our structures of state. I think that's sound, don't you? He has commented upon what is wrong with the status quo, and his ideas going forward are a little vague, but perhaps he's not a political scientist. Do we need to be a plumber to know our pipes are blocked? A mechanic to know our car won't start? No. So this is a fatuous objection, isn't it? And as it happens, another variant of the ad hominem. It's an attack upon the man to encourage you to dismiss what the man is saying before you even begin to think about what the man is saying. So, our objections to the wisdom of brand would seem to amount to fatuous ad hominem attacks and an insistence that even if the system doesn't work, we must still use the system we have because it's the system. Even if it demonstrably doesn't work, doesn't do what it's supposed to do, we must still use it. We are not allowed to deviate from its processes even if said processes fail to avail us any agency. But then, if we have no agency in our society, then that society, by definition, isn't a democracy, is it? So the objection that not voting undermines democracy is irrelevant, because in a democracy one has agency, but we don't have agency, so this isn't a democracy, so we can't be undermining democracy, can we? And I'd like to round off this piece by pointing out that many of the objections to what Brand has said have come from the left. He is wrong because he's successful and doesn't understand the condition of the alienated proletariat. He is wrong because he hasn't pushed an ideologically articulate alternative to the status quo. He is wrong because he's affluent and therefore, of necessity, the enemy. The natural implication of these objections is that only poor people, not blessed with some talent, acumen or drive that allows them to change their condition and who are therefore abject victims of society, have any right to kick up about things. How might such simple, plebeian, poor, inarticulate and unthinking persons kick up? A riot, perhaps? Ah, Brand advocates the riot. He's rather swallowed a little bit of the establishment shtick himself. Hey, nobody's perfect. The grand revolt of the half-witted incompetence looms. Apparently, the great spectre that haunts the middle classes, whether they'll admit it or not. Pinch some trainers. Eighteen months. Destroy the world economy. A bonus. After all, people should know their place. And their place is rioting whilst their betters prepare to seize control from the bad guys once the dust has settled. When I first went to college, more than 20 years ago, I attended the Freshers' Fair. There were, as there always are, tables promoting clubs and groups, and this included a communist group. I read a pamphlet and agreed to attend a meeting. Meeting was duly attended, and as is often the way with any coming together of students, there was a party around someone's flat afterwards. There was, of course, drinking, mostly to the accompaniment of Bob Marley and the Doors. Nice. Stuff was being handed around, there was plenty of booze. You get the picture. I was sat on the floor between my two new friends. They were second or third years and busily taking me through the precepts of their Marxist outlook. I was enjoying my booze and interested in what they were telling me about the working classes. Conversation took many turns, but there came a point where it was revealed that one of these chaps was the son of a doctor and the other was the son of a lawyer. My father was a pipe fitter. These guys knew exactly what the working classes needed to do in order to create a society which they, as the intellectual elite, would manage appropriately for the good of all. But they knew nothing of the working classes. Well, they knew what the working classes did. They worked. Well, <laughs> somebody has to, right? The working classes' best interest would be served through their obedience to those who knew best. The working classes needed to revolt. They needed to be fighting in the streets. The governing elites needed to be taken down. And when done and dusted... The Marxists would assume control. Mr. Brand talks of revolution. He's a bit vague on how to actually go about it, but he hardly comes across as bloodthirsty. This puts him ahead of my one-time student compatriots. I think, were he to reflect upon it, Brand would know, as I do, that the likes of he and I would be the cannon fodder for their revolution. There are different types of revolution. I like the ones with reason and without guns. Because otherwise it'll just be ideologues who know what's best for us and are happy to see us dead for our own good, just as long as they get to rule. Because they know best. Meet the new boss. Same as the old boss.
Lenin did not personally storm no gates. He wasn't very funny either. But a revolution of wit in all senses, that's exactly what we need. Thought, playfulness, intelligence and actual engagement, not subservience. Be that to a sense of class or an ideology, be that ideology, socialism or monetarism or whatever. This isn't about supporting a team. This is about using our intelligence to live long, enriched, engaged, fulfilling lives. That's what all of this is about. And having a bit of a laugh. Listen to Mr. Brand. Uh, disagree with him, as I do in part. But I'll tell you what, Mr. Webb. If you attempt to merely dismiss him or to insist that he has broken some cardinal rule that necessarily puts him beyond all pales, then you are of the orthodoxy. You are of the enemy. Come on. Let's give these buggers a bit of a kicking. <laughs> Vote green.